Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the St. Petersburg Virtual Science Fair Festival for a school day. I'm incredibly excited to have Jim Ivey here with us next. And he's here at the University of South Florida in St. Petersburg. And so what he's going to be talking about is if some of you are thinking about going to college and what are the, some of the types of research and some of the type of things that you can do as an undergraduate while attending college at you know universities like the University of South Florida, St. Petersburg. So, Jim, go ahead and take it away. Thank you a lot, David. Uh, I, I was going to share my screen and, and bring up a little presentation I put together, and then we'll have a little time for question and answers at the end of it. Um, as he, he mentioned, I'm a, um, a professor at the University of South Florida, and my specialty is um, environmental science. Um, I actually started off as an oceanographer, but I feel in environmental science because it's such a cool field because there's so many different aspects of it. It is such a uh, kind of a holistic field where you can um, where you can do everything from policy to research. And so what I want to really talk to y'all about today is some of the things that my, our students are doing as undergraduates. Normally you think of research as being somebody with a PhD or a master's degree at least start you know, at a higher level doing it. But I want to show you that you can do research as an undergraduate here or at your level in, in, in high school, elementary school or wherever you're at. Um, so these are some of the things that, that our students are doing, some really cool um, research projects they've got going on, um, some that they've got going on in the future that students coming here can join them with. And also, I'm going to give you some pointers on how to get involved in research, so if you can apply right now. One of the things that I like to emphasize in my courses is how we can apply this towards something that people can use in the real world. So. Here at USF St. Pete, we've got a very unique location. If you haven't been to our course, into our area, we're right on the water. Our backyard is Tampa Bay. We can walk out of here and do an experiment. In fact, you'll see some of the experiments, some of the things that the students are doing are based on the fact that we're right here in the bay. And we've got a, a very unique location right here in, in a heavy urban area, but with all the natural resources of water and, and mangrove swamps and stuff. I mean, I could walk a, about a block and I've, I've seen mangroves. So we experiment on our backyard. Um, I'm going to talk about first some uh, past and their possible future projects. They're projects that students might carry on in the future that are um, that are interesting and unique. Um, these are some that my students have done. Did, I'm not focusing on just the ones that we do in class, but some of the ones that we do these students do as independent projects, the ones that they do outside of class. So one of this, this is a Baybur study. This started off with a graduate student. And we got to look around and Baybur is the bay right out here behind USF. And there is all sorts of stuff around us. I mean, if, if, if you come to USF, you'll find it's not just our, um, our USF St. Pete, it's not just our campus, but we've got Florida Fish and Wildlife on our campus. We've got just down the street, NOAA, the, the National Ocean um, and Atmospheric Association. We've got the USGS down the street. We've got a, a, a variety of different groups the, looking at science around us. And I worked for eight years at Florida Fish and Wildlife studying red tides. And we tested our instruments in the bay, but nobody has been really studying and compiling data on our backyard here. So Stephanie set out to do that. And to help her out, she brought in about 20 different undergraduate students. So the, the people working on this project were Dr. Chris Mindel, myself, Dr. Osgovic, and Stephanie Leonard, and then about 20 students. So we came in and trained students. They went out the bay. This is something that we're using just equipment that we've got lying around here. And it's something that anybody from high school students on up could do fairly well. So to me, this was an interesting project and we hopefully maybe we can continue this. Another project, this also started with a graduate student that brought in undergraduate students. Um, a, some folks at a lake down here, just down the road from us off of 4th Street, um, Crescent Lake, um, started noticing that during the winter when no, normally Florida lakes are fairly clear, this lake would turn green and they couldn't figure out what was going on. So we wanted to help them out. And so this lake, um, and I, I, Dr. Mindel, who also uh, was on the um, committee for this project, um, kind of coined this term of urban lake syndrome. So what they did is the, this was a natural lake, but back, I guess, in the like the 1920s, 1930s, 
they decided to make it into a subdivision. And so they dug out and, and, and homes on the lake, you know, because it, it's it apparently sold homes pretty well. So they dug out this lake. It was originally a shallow, typical shallow farm lake. They dug it down to 40 feet, took all the sediment out and piled it up around the lake. And so then as the city grew up around it, this lake started turning into a retention pond and there's all these storm drains running into it. And then it runs out to clean by you. Well, what is happening with this lake? Um, um, our graduate student Benjamin Stanley found out and Ali and, um, and uh, Brianne, his uh, assistants, was that during the, during the summer, it formed what's known as a stratification layer. It formed a layer of where there was a, um, a layer of where um, there, was a head, there was a light layer on top and a dense layer down the bottom. And this trapped lots of nutrients, fertilizer, dead stuff down at the bottom. And during the winter, this was all shooting up to the surface. And that was what's causing algal bloom. So we hope to eventually carry on with this, uh, uh, this too later. This was a really neat study. This is something, I'm not involved in this, Dr. Debbie Castle, a, a, a colleague of mine who's got an office right next to me, um, and just down from me is a whole room full of spiders. So Louis Coticchio, he had told me to pronounce his name, hopefully I get it right, started, he's an undergraduate and started noticing, he, he loves spiders. So he started studying a, a question about why some of the black widows were disappearing and where the brown widows were coming from. So the brown widows are an invasive species. They're not native of Florida. And so he did a study where he basically put them together and saw how they would combat each other. And apparently the, the juvenile brown, wizard, brown widows and the juvenile black widows are, the, the brown widows will actually aggressively hunt down and kill and eat the black widows. So the brown widows are actually taking out the black widows. The, and some people that are creeped out by this, it's a good thing, story for Halloween. Some people that are creeped out by this might note also that the um, that the brown widows are less, less poisonous than the black widows. The bad news is they breed faster and cover a larger area. But um, this is an example of something that the student actually brought to the professor. Uh, Dr. Castle is noted for her studies of insects, especially um, uh, ants, but this is kind of neat. Um, another uh, study, uh, a student brought this to me. Um, they noticed that some teachers at elementary school were starting to get sick. And we started researching and found out this, this area was actually built on top of a toxic waste dump. Uh, they, they were disposing of stuff from downtown St. Pete back during the 40s when they had a incinerator. They were dumping it here. And so we're still testing this site. But she, if you see um, Crystal back there, she's uh, the student there. Um, and I worked on this with Dr. Pandy. Um, she's actually boiling um, samples of dirt and nitric acid to try and extract the metals. And we tested it and it actually has fairly high levels of lead. Normally lead you're looking at in parts per thousand or, or you know, this was, well, parts per thousand is pretty bad. We are seeing that um, here. We're seeing about 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about some of our future projects. Some of the projects that we've got going on that, um, that we hope to, that are starting right now and we're gonna carry on the future. It's things that people can get involved with. Um, I started working with, I originally graduated from the College of Marine Sciences. I've got a degree in oceanography. And so I've got a lot of friends over there. And I was talking with one of them one day, they said, hey, you know, we would like to have students go out on these cruises with us and help us put our buoys out. So how many of y'all would like to go out on a, 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 a a uh, hundred, I think it's a 120 foot boat, the, the weather bird behind there, or it's 120, 140 foot, and put out buoys out into the um, water. Um, well, my students did. That's um, Ali and Andrea, um, two students um, from the um, from USF St. Pete. And they went out and helped them. They're actually out on the buoy itself. And an interesting thing, if you look at the background of the picture on the right, there's a student in the light blue dress be light blue, light, blue, light blue shirt, excuse me, is a former student of ours who's now gone on to graduate work at the College of Marine Sciences. Um, so the, um, the, the big thing about this is you get experience going out to sea, you get experience with physical oceanography, you learn how some of these instruments work. And this is in, in part with uh, uh, Jason Law over at the College of Marine Sciences and Dr. Weisberg and me and numerous students. We have four or five students every uh, every year that go out with them. They're in fact starting to sign up folks right now for our for going out and working with them. Another program 
this is um, Dr. Bernali Dixon um, oversees this. It's called ICAR, the Initiative on Coastal Adaptation Resilience. So she brings in undergraduate students and helps them work in minority communities, um, communities that are marginalized. And resilience is how bad, how, how easily after a really bad disaster or, or bad situation does the community bounce back? So one of the things they investigate is climate change or or hurricanes and how 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 what does it take for this community to get back up to the same economics and the same progress and the same people living in that area. So they work and do graphic information systems where they map these areas. They go out and do studies and surveys and they actually hire students to do this. And so uh, Dr. Dixon is the um, is the is the director of this. But we also have Donnie, Dr. Smoke and Dr. Johns, who are on the executive committee. And those are all professors here at USF St. Pete. Now, this is a new study. This is something we're just getting funding from. And we're getting it from the manufacturer. Um, they're helping us out. And we're also applying for a small grant. But um, um, Wendy Malamba, uh, our um, sustainability coordinator, uh, Dr. Osikovic and myself, um, all started working on this project. And we've got a, um, a student, a mentioned her down here at the bottom, Emma Jacobs and, um, and uh, Andrea that was in the previous one. They are on our Student Green Energy Fund Committee. So here the students actually oversee projects to go out and um, put out um, things that promote sustainability. They've um, funded solar panels. They funded um, water bottle um, sites uh, at filter water bottle sites at a lot of our, um, our water fountains around here. So this is one of the things they funded. And this is in our, our cafeteria. It's a digester that takes organic material, takes the leftover food waste. You know, only certain types can go in there, of course. But it breaks it down into a kind of an organic slurry liquid that it pumps out into the um, wastewater treatment, um, the sanitary sewers. And the wastewater treatment plants will then move the effluent, this, this digested material. Well, the company and us are interested in the idea of using it as a fertilizer. We want to close the loop. We want to take us from being, um, from, we want to take it from being, it, instead of, um, instead of being something that we dispose of, I mean, right now it's, it's much better than just putting it in the landfill, but we want to make it something that will be fertilized plants, just like composting. So our students are going to start testing this where they, we're going to take the fluid and we're going to try it on different types of plants. We're going to measure, you know, how does it affect the bacteria in the soil? So we we'll, we got um, a, a professor that's going to help us out with this, um, looking at the um, at the um, doing some genetic testing to see what the types of microbes are there. My students are going to look at the nutrient levels. We're going to see how it changes the soil and see how well the plants grow with it, to see if this is an alternative to just dumping the stuff down the drain. Um, Here's Lou again. I had to conclude you twice because he's got two really cool projects. Um, everybody's heard of brown recluse spiders. Well, brown recluse spiders are not native to Florida. In fact, most people, uh, and Lou points this out in the upper right-hand corner here, um, there is a, an image of a recluse spider and a Florida house spider. And the um, Florida house spider is a lot of times, this is, I learned this from Lou, a lot of times the Florida house spider is mistaken for the brown recluse. So brown recluse are, are toxic spiders. When they bite you, they can sometimes um, uh, poison you and, and create a necrosis where it eats out the tissue. So they're not ones we want around. Well, Lou got the researching on it and he's got a web page over here. You see it down at the bottom. If you, if you go to the Facebook page, the Florida Brown Recluse Project, if you see one of these spiders, contact Lou through it and he will come out and check. So he's going to do this as an undergrad in hopes to carry it into graduate school to get a PhD in studying spiders. But um, he went to this, the place he's found in St. Augustine, he's found five single houses that have not the standard brown recluse, but the Mediterranean recluse. So you see the, the image over here um, um, of the United States shows where the brown recluse are not normally located. So he's trying to come up with, with Dr. Castle again as his advisor, trying to come up and determine are these spiders um, setting, getting a foothold here in Florida. And then this is something that I'm I've got a student helping me out with, uh, Carolina Montiel. Um, she, uh, she, uh, 
Dr. Tomonash is the is a main advisor of me and several others across campuses are trying to figure out is COVID-19 being spread on surfaces. When you put your hand on that doorknob and then touch your face, are you get are you really risking getting COVID-19? Is it staying there? And is that a way we could test on see how well it's moving throughout our community? So we've been um, we've been going out every Thursday and swabbing all the high traffic areas. We use these um, little tidy swabs like this. And we'll wipe them down and send them to Dr. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Unash and his laboratory will do the um, genetic testing to see if COVID's present. So we're seeing we're trying to do our safety across there. And then this is a project that um, Carolina and uh, another student, Casey Arteco, are helping out with. I've been working with a company called In Situ. If you see in the background, there's kind of a little pipe-like thing. That's a water quality instrument. And so one of my one of my specialties is looking at changes in in water changes that are that humans are putting on natural systems and to do that we put out i put out water quality instruments and sometimes they come back looking like this one up in the um up in my main picture here um those are particles and so we're trying to come up with ways of getting rid of them normally what we would do is we would wrap it with heavy tape and then we would um we wrap it with heavy tape and then we would paint it with bifalc paint and this would release some copper in the water. And then other times they spray it with Teflon and that releases the Teflon compounds of the water. Um, so the company sponsoring us to test this, this new material that's kind of a silicon based that supposedly is more environmentally friendly. So why do you wanna do research? Why should you think about doing research? One of the big things to think about is experience. If you want to do research at, for, a, um, for a career, this is good experience. You can start as young as possible. When I was a, in elementary school, this is this is a true story. My parents actually bought me a dissecting set. I would dissect insects, as as and, and I, I would keep insects. Uh, but I went on to study oceans. But um, it was really good experience to me. But I was conducting my own experiments then. It's also a way to make contact so that if you do decide to go further in the career or further into graduate school, you can know, there, you can make contacts with people that can help you get there, that can uh, provide you with um, jobs or provide you with um, with education. You can also publish it and present it. You're not limited to present publishing and presentations if you are if you are just having a PhD. Um, we have students who publish all the time. Um, and you can also use to build your resume, to build your background. So if you're applying for a good college or um, you're applying for graduate school after that, you have got something there. You can say, hey, I did this. So how do you use your research? Well, you can present it at a symposium. There's a lot of virtual symposiums out, just like we're doing right here. There's a lot of small local forums you can go to. If you, if you research around, you talk to your teachers, you talk to some of, the, some of the professors at the college, they may have a suggestion. There may be a, 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 a so we're in St. Petersburg, since we've, we've got a um, area where a lot of people come to have these conventions because we're kind of a resort area. Um, you can also sometimes, um, some of these places uh, uh, that you go to they will let you travel and they have student grants. I got to go to Hawaii when I was younger because um, one of my professors had a grant that, that covered it. And you can go to conferences. There are conferences that undergraduates go to. You can even write a paper. There's some journals that set undergraduate research and even high school research, the Florida Academy of Sciences promotes undergraduate research by allowing them to um, publish within their journal. But most of all, you can use it as a class project. You can use it as something that you can carry through um, your entire career. So how do you get involved with this? First, study professors, study people here and say, co contact me, email or call them up, say, can I visit? I'd love to be part of your project or I'm, I'm interested in something like this ask me part of these projects they're doing. And you may have to start out with something that's different from what you're interested in. You may have to start out doing some research that's similar, but not quite the same. And look for existing programs, go through, and there's all sorts of things going on out there where you can volunteer or that you can, um, or, or like our ICAR here, or the Tampa Bay Estuary Program, where you can go out and you can do some stuff and work with scientists. It may be kind of basic work where you're front starting off like planting a seagrass, but it, it will get, it, it may lead into something else. And once you get into this, you can start finding funding. Um, here at USF, we got a program called Pivot 
that you can it, that we pay for that as a student they can you can log on to and look up all sorts of grants also talk to different companies sometimes companies like the one that uh, i'm dealing with will give you some funding and nonprofits like uh, the nature conservancy or sierra club they may have some uh, projects and may have funding for students to do that so get out there and look for types of research and so i appreciate your time and do you have any questions Awesome, Jim. I love the presentation. Thank you. There's a lot of great insights in there for students who are thinking about doing different things in college. Um, so we are starting to get a couple questions in and we're going to do our best to get to as many as possible. If we don't get to yours, don't get discouraged. Submit it. What we're doing is we're taking all the questions down and we're going to try to get answers and we'll send them out to all the different teachers. Again, we have a roughly, I think, 3,300 students participating at some point during the day. Um, now, also one quick little announcement uh, for those of you watching at home, uh, track A will have a 1.30 session. Uh, it's a late edition. Uh, it's going to be DMG glass blowing. So you can, if you want to watch that session, uh, just click on track A and that will take you over there. Okay, so one of the first questions I got was, are there any animals that you're afraid of? So you had some stuff talking about the spiders and you don't seem to have any worries about them. So is there anything, are there spiders or are there animals that you're afraid of? I would have to say the one I'm most afraid of, and I, I, I think it best this, is a uh, wasp. Um, when I was a kid, I was playing on a, uh, my parents had a teeter-totter, uh, a big monster one made out of, uh, out of big pipes. And I got stuck between it and a group of paper wasps came out and stung me a bunch of times. So I'm actually terrified of wasps. Um, but that's really the only animal I guess I could say that I'm afraid of. But I have respect for other animals. Like I'm not really afraid of spiders, but I respect them. A spider is only going to bite you if you try and squish them. So I, I should give them plenty of space. So do the students create projects at all or are the projects only created by the teachers? Actually, that's a, that's a great question. Most of my projects were created by the students. They are stuff that the students came up with an idea, brought it to us. The um, the project where they uh, where they studied the elementary school that was a total student project. But they come to us, and we have done some similar projects. Um, I do a lot of water quality study, um, and the students will come to me and ask me a question. And I'll say, well, I don't know, or I could look it up, or I know how to do this. This is something I've done. Um, a few of them are brought to us that we have like the um, ICAR, the uh, buoys, and these projects where I'm doing the biofouling. But majority of those projects I've presented, the students brought to me. So the school that you said that where the teachers were getting sick, is that school safe now? We don't know yet. We're still studying it. Um, I will tell you this, at the school, the um, the ground was considered so toxic that they they had a, a, a group that came out there and put in um, flower beds with plants, uh, with edible plants, and they were not allowed to plant them in the ground. They had to build them in sealed above beds. Okay. So what do you look for? What do teachers look for when students say, hey, I want to do research? What do, the stu what do teachers and the leaders look for when students come to them wanting to do research? It's a great question. Um, first, I, I'm a big I'm, I'm a big follower of the scientific method. So I want to see that the student or or if the student comes to me with the question, if I can refine it down to a hypothesis that we can test, and one that has the what a hypothesis a testable hypothesis that is doable within the methods that we have available. I mean, students have come to me with all sorts of fantastic ideas, and I'm like. Yeah, that's great, but it will cost a million dollars to do. You know, um, uh, how about this? <laughs> we can do this one for ten bucks. That's kind of what we can afford. Okay, so back to the spiders. Why do you think the brown spiders are eating the black spiders? Well, it is somehow, it, I, I, and I, this is not my area specialty. This is Lou's. I, I, so I was reporting on what he had, but it was this is so. This is my guess on it, but I would guess that certain spiders um, have a territoriality to them. Um, there, there are certain animals have territoriality. When other, other animals move into competition with them, they have different ways. They can either move to another area where they're not interfering with each other, or they, such as a different ecological niche. We're seeing that with an invasive species, a brown, uh, brown um, 
anoles here in Florida and the green anoles, which used to be found under the ground, are now moved up to the top of the trees. Well, other types, the, the invader or the one that's in competition will try and destroy its competition. And so it would be my guess that that's the adaptation of the brown wizard, I mean brown wizard, brown, brown, spider, brown widow, <laughs> oh, brown widow, sorry. Um, like my tongue gets tossed every now and then, you know, but anyway, the, the, that's, the, that's probably the adaptation of the brown widow that it, would, it will go in and try and kill off its competition. And so that would be my guess on it. But uh, Lou would, if you, want, if, you want me, if you send me an email reminder, I'll ask Lou directly and give you the expert's answer. Wonderful. Well, Jim, thank you very much. Uh, incredibly informative session. So hopefully you might get some students thinking like, I could do stuff like this too, because they can. So yeah. once again, thank you all. And I look forward to chatting with you in our next session. Thank Ta you, Dr. Rosario. Bye everybody. Bye.